morning.
It is good to see everyone today. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, the eighth chapter, verses 26 through 40. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep who he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded his chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When he came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Ezotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Well, on a chilly day in November in Manhattan, there was a musician who was playing at the Starbucks Cafe at 51st and Broadway. He was playing tunes from the 40s all through to the 90s on his keyboard, and he had a partner, and they were singing together. He noticed a woman swaying in her seat and singing rather loudly to one of the songs. Afterwards, she apologized for singing, but he thought she sounded great and invited her to sing the next selection with them. She asked him if he knew any hymns. So he picked, his eye is on the sparrow. Everyone in the Starbucks listened attentively as they sang, I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. The people in Starbucks gave her thunderous applause. She turned to the musician and she said, it's funny you picked that hymn. It was my daughter's favorite. She was 16 and she died last week from a brain tumor. I'm going to be okay. I keep trusting the Lord and singing his songs. 
Was that a chance encounter or a divine appointment? Have you ever had an experience where you felt like the Holy Spirit had directed you to be in the right place at the right time and perhaps have just the right words to say? In the scripture today, we read about Philip meeting the Ethiopian eunuch. It most assuredly was a divine appointment as Philip was following the direction of the Spirit in his life. In this story, there are these two characters, and so I want to um, give you a little bit more information about each of them so that we can understand what took place. Philip is not the disciple. This is a different Philip. Someone has described him as the second round draft pick because he wasn't one of the original 12. Rather, this Philip was someone who had been appointed a deacon in Jerusalem because there was this controversy between the Christians who were Jewish and Greek-speaking and the Christians who were Jewish and spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. There had been this conflict because it felt that those who spoke Hebrew or Aramaic were being favored. And so there were deacons appointed to help serve at the table to make sure there was no favoritism. And Philip was one of those. But Philip went further than just serving at the table. He had begun to evangelize. If you go and you read the beginning of chapter 8, you'll see he was preaching to those in Samaria. Now, in the beginning of the book of Acts, we have words from Jesus where he says to his disciples, you will teach the gospel preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What's interesting, though, is that if you read carefully in chapter 8, you see that the disciples have remained in Jerusalem, but it's this deacon, Philip, who has gone into Samaria. Because we have to understand the early church and how Christianity spread in those first days. The first Christians were Jews. They weren't uh, the Gentiles yet. It was Jewish, a Jewish sect, basically, who believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And so those first con converts were mostly in Jerusalem and then in Judea. And then they moved to the Jews who were in Samaria. Because even though they were Samaritans, they were what you might call distant cousins from the Jewish people who were in Jerusalem. So it isn't until chapters 10 and 15 in Acts that we see the first Gentile convert that was Cornelius. But here we see Philip, he's pushing the boundaries. He's already gone into Samaria, and now he's told by the Holy Spirit to take this road, and he follows. He does what the Spirit says to go out into the wilderness road. The Spirit has led Philip even further into what might be called the Samaritan hinterlands. Mar Martin Marty says, at the end of this road, there might be a sign before you start on it that says, last gas for 150 miles. It wasn't the end of the world, but you might be able to see the end of the known world from there. So he starts on his way, and he's in this liminal space, that, that space that I've been calling limbo, between between the past and the future, what's happening here is new. And for, in Philip's case, it's two liminal spaces. It's a physical space because he's pushing the physical boundary of where he's been, but it's spiritual liminality as well in that he is going to people who are not exactly who people would expect to be converted first. So who is this Ethiopian eunuch? that Philip meets. Well, we're never even told his name, but we're told a lot of information about him. He's a high official in the queen's court, and the word for queen is Candace. That's why it says the Candace um, court or something. It, it's weird in English, but it's because that word Candace just means queen in the language. And so he's over her treasury. Being Ethiopian just meant, in the language of that day, that he was from somewhere south of Egypt. And the word also meant that it was somebody who was darker skinned. We're told that he's riding in a chariot. Now, if you go look at charities, I think of those things you see where they're having horse races, or the races, and they're like standing up. If you have a chariot that has seats, 
It's a little bit bigger and fancier and nicer than those. And he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, which means he has a physical scroll. Both of those show that he was wealthy or at least had access to wealth that he could use for his personal means because we're told that he was going to Jerusalem to worship. So he was doing something on his own with this asset. We know that he's devout because it tells us he's going to worship and he's reading Isaiah. But here's the thing about the eunuch. We don't know if he was Jewish or Gentile. We can assume perhaps that he was Jewish because Acts makes such a big deal about Cornelius being the first Gentile convert. But the thing is, when he went to worship in Jerusalem, because he was a eunuch, there is a Jewish law that does not allow anyone who has mutilation to be in the inner court. He could only stay in the outer court. He couldn't go in where the Jewish people actually worshipped. He had to stay in the Gentile court. So he, in many ways, is an outsider in this situation. But the Spirit leads Philip to a divine appointment to meet this man. The encounter between the two men brings the outsider into the fold. Once Philip shares the gospel, the Ethiopian asks, is there any reason that I can't be baptized right now? Perhaps he was so used to being denied access to the divine that he expected that there would be another boundary set before him that he wouldn't be allowed to cross. But Philip gladly baptizes him. Well, what do we learn from this scripture about what divine appointments might mean in our own lives? The first is that we have to be open to them. We have to be willing to set aside our plans when we feel that the Spirit is leading to us to do something different. How many times have you had that prompt that you know, I should probably call so-and-so? And then perhaps you're in the middle of something, you think, well, I'll just finish this, let me do this, and then I'll, and then I'll call them, and then you forget to go back and call them. And you realize there was a reason you were supposed to talk to them at that time. We have to be willing to be open, but in order to do that, we have to spend time in prayer, listening to the Spirit, listening for where we might be prompted. We have to be attuned to the Spirit. The next thing that we see happening in this uh, passage is that the Ethiopian man invites Philip to sit with him, and Philip gladly does it. Both are willing to spend time with a person who is very different from themselves. Barbara Brown Taylor has said that a modern equivalent of this might be a, a diplomat in Washington, D.C., inviting a street preacher into his Lexus to do Bible study. One preacher, another preacher, has said that this illustrates the call that we have to find the most interesting person to sit with to have a conversation with. So I'm an introvert, and some of you might relate that when you walk into a room of new people as an introvert, you tend to hold yourself back. You're not sure what's going on. I will usually find the most inconspicuous place to sit down. Ron, on the other hand, is the extrovert <laughs> who wants to be in the front of the class. He wants to be in the thick of things. He wants to be around people. How is it with you, though? When you walk into a room, are you looking for the friendly face or are you looking for the person who needs a friend? Are we willing to sit with somebody who might be the most interesting person in the room? Finally, we see Philip and the Ethiopian man studying the scripture together. When Philip asks the man if he understands what he's reading, he responds by saying, I need somebody to guide me. How can I know if someone isn't there to guide me? When we study and read scripture together, we expand our understanding of God's word. What's interesting to me is that the scripture that's quoted here is Isaiah 53. But if you read a few more chapters on into Isaiah, in Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 5, this is what you'll read. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord, say, 
The Lord will surely separate me from my people. Do not let the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Truly, through this divine appointment, the Ethiopian eunuch was brought into the house of God. We're told that once he was baptized, he went on his way rejoicing. This is truly a story about those who are at the edges and are brought into Christian community. The community of God that is created in the book of Acts, if you read through this book, it's formed from every nation, from every people, and no one is excluded because of who they are. We're called, like Philip, to share the gospel with everyone. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for all people. At one time, you might have felt yourself on the outside. Many people who are brought into Christian faith are people who thought of themselves as outsiders, as people who looked in and weren't sure if they were welcome or not. When we come inside the house of the Lord, we can't lock the doors behind us. We have to be willing to continue to welcome everyone that would come and to remember that we are here by the grace of God and that our call is to share that grace with all people. Too often, we want to stay in our comfort zone. We do want to sit with the familiar person It's easy to be there. Philip might have been the second string, but he followed where the Spirit led him. And through his sharing, the gospel moved beyond boundaries. How is God calling us in this time to move beyond the boundaries of where we feel comfortable and settled? How is the Spirit leading you to find the most interesting person you can, and to spend time with that person, not just to share the gospel, but so that you might know them, and they might change you as well. We've been brought near to God through grace, and it is our calling to watch for those divine appointments, for those places where the Spirit is whispering to us, to share God's love, to share our faith, to be in relationship with people who might be different than us. Where can we continue to share God's grace across boundaries? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, whose mercy and love extend beyond all the boundaries and divisions that we create, we confess that too often we have been hesitant to extend extend ourselves beyond our comfort zone. Unstop our ears that we might listen to the promptings of your spirit, leading us into relationships which we never would have sought out on our own. Open our eyes to those who are in need of friendship. Show us how to reach across divisions that we might mend relationships with those who don't look or act or even believe like we do. Lord, we know that this is only possible through your love and through the action of your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit on us that we might truly be your heart, your hands, and your feet in this time and in this place. Lord, there are so many hurting people who are in need of friendship, who are in need of your grace and love. Lord, we especially lift before you those who are suffering today in need of healing in body and mind and spirit. Might they know your healing touch, restoring them to health and wholeness. We lift before you those who grieve that they might find comfort in your spirit. Show us ways that we can offer grace and peace. 
Help us to lay the things that burden us at your feet, knowing that you hear our prayers, that you love us and care for us. We ask all of these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would remind those of you here that uh, the offering plates are at the door where you can leave your offering as you go. And for those at home, you're welcome to send that to the church at any time. As you're offering this week to God, I invite you as well to listen carefully, to look for the divine appointments that might be in your path this week, to find the person who might need a friend, and spend a few moments maybe just listening so that they might experience the grace and love of God through you. Let us sing together, Spirit of Faith, Come Down. May you go forth listening for the Spirit and following where the Spirit leads. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>